Hey everyone, in this video we're going to continue talking about universalistic theories of ethics, and in this video we're going to look at rights ethics. Typically when we're talking about rights ethics we're referring to natural rights, but we could also be referring to stuff like positive rights and welfare rights as well. So we'll start by looking at the old school natural rights ethics, and we'll look at some of the historical documents there. Then we'll talk a little bit about positive and welfare rights, and then we'll look at a little bit of critique of rights as well. So in this video specifically, I'm going to look at the English legacy of rights. Let's get into it. So just as natural law kind of grew out of virtue ethics, rights ethics kind of grows out of natural law ethics. So here are the key claims of natural rights ethics. They come out of our human nature, which for some is a special creation of God. That is, they're just there. They're God-given. You'll hear that expression, God-given rights. Humans have rights. You might be thinking, what about animal rights? Well, at least on this view, it's the view that inanimate objects don't have rights. Like a building does not have a right or something like that. Also on this view, rights are self-evident and inalienable. That is, they're obvious and they can't be taken away. And you don't have to qualify to earn these rights. These are not rights that you gain. They're inherent. And rights exist independently and prior to duties. So again, you don't have to sign up for them. You've got them anyway. Now, there's a couple of different types of rights. Natural rights, also called negative rights because they can't be taken away, are the rights that you're born with. They're the ones that are sometimes called the God-given rights. These are not conferred. They are just there. All right, let's start by talking about what a right is. A right is essentially an entitlement to be able to do something or to have the entitlement to not have to do something. Now, when we look at rights in the ancient world, they're usually related to specific individuals and specific classes. For example, the nobility or the king or the emperor or something like that. For example, in ancient India, we can talk about the rights of the Brahmins and the Kshatriyas, the, the priests and the warriors. In medieval Europe, we might talk about the clergy and the nobility, again, the priests and the warrior, land-owning class, or what have you. But we see that rights are specified not to the whole people, not to everyone, not to all these citizens, or as they would be called in the ancient world, subjects, sometimes even slaves. Rights didn't apply to everyone, they're applied to certain people. Just like when you get a degree, you might even say this on your high school diploma, it says that you have been granted the degree or diploma of whatever the kind of degree it is, and it will say on there with all the rights and privileges appertaining there too. Not everyone has the right to your degree when you receive it only you do or the person who's the recipient of the degree similarly rights in the ancient world are relegated to specific individuals and specific classes all over the world they might call it something different of course the word right is an english word but that concept of i'm the king and therefore i get to do this with my kingdom or i'm the duke and i get to do this with my duchy or dukedom or this is my house and i get to have the right to this or what have you individual rights come up in specific kinds of transactions and specific kinds of situations but they're relegated to specific situations it's not something that's for everyone at least in the ancient construction now all over the world we also do see instances of where who receives rights expands we see it in india we see it in ancient china where who gets rights expands to other classes and other kinds of peoples and other individuals but at least in the so-called western world where we really see things start to change is in the england of 1215 so what happens in england in 1215 is that king john finds himself in a situation where the barons of england have rebelled against him and they find themselves in a military position where they've got a better bargaining position than he does. And so what they do is they bargain for themselves and they want greater rights and concessions for themselves, which John, being in a weaker position, does grant. Now, people will look back on this in history and say, oh, this was a great moment in the development of rights. Again, it's not rights for everyone, it's rights for the barons that found themselves in a position where they said, either you grant us these rights or we'll continue to rebel which John said, okay, fine, I'll grant these rights. And then they say, okay, we're done rebelling. And at the time, it was considered so repugnant that even the Pope said of the Magna Carta, the Pope at the time being Innocent III, by such violence and fear as might affect the most courageous of men, there has been an agreement that is illegal, unjust, harmful to royal rights, and shameful to the English people. It is null and void of all validity forever. So the Pope... Not a fan there. Of course, King John, not a fan there. But nevertheless, it takes effect, at least for a while. Of course, there's some back and forth struggles over the next couple of decades. King John doesn't make it past 1216. And there are continual struggles between the king and the 
barons. And this goes on for several centuries, and we'll see develops into some other issues. But in England, starting really here, there's a struggle between the king and the other high-ranking people in the kingdom, the barons, the nobility. Now, there had already existed for the last 150 years a conflict between the king and the church leadership, and we'll see that work itself out over time, too. So what are some of these concessions in the Magna Carta? And I'm just going to go through a couple of these elements of the Magna Carta just to give you a feel for what it's like and to see how it's not really about rights for everybody, but rights for a few. In the first place, have granted to God, and by this our present charter, that is, they're talking about the Magna Carta itself, of which this is, confirm for us and our heirs forever that the English church shall be free and shall have its rights undiminished and its liberties unimpaired. Free from whom? Interference from the king. Now, historically, you'll see that that doesn't really work out because with Henry VIII, a few centuries later, Henry VIII is the head of the Church of England. And to this day, the current Queen of England, Elizabeth II, is still technically the head of the Church of England. They continue, we have also granted to all free men of our kingdom for ourselves and for our heirs forever all the liberties written below to be had and held by them and their heirs of us and our heirs. What free men? Landowners people who are nobility, working class, if you will, serfs. There isn't really a middle class as such yet. Not free people, not free men. So look at some of the specifics in here. If any of our earls or barons or others holding of us in chief by night service dies, and at his death his heir be of full age. So look, we're talking about specifics of nobility when they die, what happens. If, however, the heir of any such be under age and a ward, he shall have his inheritance when he comes of age without paying relief and without... All right, so basically we're talking about an inheritance tax in the 13th century. The guardian of the land of such an heir who is under age shall take from the land... Again, notice here we're already just talking about landowners. We'll look at a couple more just so you can see that's what's going on here. Moreover, so long as he has wardship of the land, the guardian shall keep in repair the houses, parks, preserves, ponds, mills, and other things pertaining to the land out of the revenues from it. What you're supposed to do if you're a landowner in England in 1215. Heirs shall be married without disparagement, yet so that before the marriage is contracted, those nearest in blood to the heir shall have notice. Heirs to what? Heirs to the estate of landowners. Peculiarly, there's rights to cities, and the city of London shall have all its ancient liberties and free customs as well as by land as by water. Furthermore, we will and grant that all other cities, boroughs, towns, and ports shall have all their liberties and free customs. So notice, I know when we think of rights today, you might be thinking of, and we'll get there, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This is not that. Here, we're talking about the rights of landowners, and we're talking about their relation to property, like cities here, what rights they're entitled to, what rights the barons are entitled to, and that means the king is losing some of his entitlement as these barons and others are gaining entitlement. The rights of the king diminish as the rights of the other nobles increase. Again, we're not talking about the common people, though, at this point. But now we need to fast forward a little bit through English history. And this is important to us now here in the United States, too. So one of the things that happens after this is that effectively with the Magna Carta, the rights of the king has diminished somewhat and the rights of the nobles have increased somewhat. And over time, the assembly of nobles eventually grows into what's called Parliament, which still exists today and is essentially the legislative body of the United Kingdom today. We're not quite there yet. The king is still considered the sovereign. And even on paper today, the, the monarchs are still considered the sovereigns of the United Kingdom kingdom, which it still is, at least on paper. In reality, it works a bit differently than that now. But nevertheless, that symbolism that exists in the United Kingdom today, from which the United States developed out of a rebellion upon that kingdom, so keep that in play too. To get to that point, though, there were developments that happened after this in the subsequent centuries. There were various struggles between dynastic rulers. There's the War of the Roses, where the House of York and the House of Lancaster fight over who's going to be the rulers of England. And essentially, neither team loses, but kind of a relative of Team Lancaster ends up winning with the House of Tudor, Henry VII defeats the last York King, Richard III, in battle, which is the last time that happened in the history of England, that someone became king by defeating the other king in battle, and Henry VII becomes King of England, the House of Tudor. And then Henry VIII, his son, becomes king, and Henry VIII is the one that declares the Church of England free from Rome just because he wants to get a divorce from his wife that the Pope won't grant to 
to him, and there's a lot of stuff going on there. But the King of England ends up making himself sovereign over not only the domain of England, and there's also some interaction with other states of the British Isles, Scotland and Ireland too, but I don't want to get into that for the purposes of this talk. Eventually now there's some fighting between Protestants and Catholics too, which happens in Henry VIII's time. So Henry VIII is around when Martin Luther, Martin Luther, and John Calvin are around, so there's a lot of debate about Protestantism and Catholicism that wasn't there before. And so in England, there's different sides being taken. So after he dies, his son, who's a Protestant, Edward VI becomes king, but he's a little kid, and he doesn't reign very long because he's in poor health. And really, it's other Protestant leaders that are in charge. And then his daughter from his first wife that he wanted to get a divorce from, Queen Mary becomes queen, and she's Catholic, and she's enraged at all the Protestants, but then she doesn't produce any offspring with her husband, so her sister, who is the daughter of Henry VIII from his second wife, who happens to be a Protestant, becomes Queen of England, that's Queen Elizabeth I, and she's a Protestant, and she is queen for quite some time and makes some compromises between Catholics and Protestants that make some little things a little less intense. So it looks like actually at this time power is increasing. It looks like the monarch is now the head of the church. Things are going up. Then what happens next is Elizabeth does not have any heirs. And so since she doesn't have any heirs, the crown of England passes to her cousin, actually her cousin's son, King James VI of Scotland, who becomes King James I of England. And so he's king of England and Scotland at the same time. He was king of Scotland first, then becomes king of England too. And King James is well known for a bunch of things. King James Bible, that's named after him because it was commissioned during his time. Jamestown, Virginia, the first English colony in America that lasted, was named after him because he was king at the time, early 1600s. And he's a Protestant ruler. Is he a devout Protestant? Probably not, but he's on team Protestantism. But then his son, becomes king, Charles I. And Charles I is a Catholic king, despite his father James being Protestant. And this is at a time where things have been going pretty well for Protestantism, and just with Parliament especially, there becomes a greater tension between roundheads that are pro-Parliament, and then you've got cavaliers that are pro-king. Eventually, they start to fight one another, and in short, what happens is the parliamentarians, the roundheads, win, and in the 1600s, actually in 1649, based on a decree of Parliament, Parliament signs the death warrant of King Charles I, and they cut off his head. So I know we think of it in America, like, oh, the Declaration of Independence, which is about 140 years later. Oh, that's a big deal. We really told it to King George III. A century and a half earlier, the English nobility, people in, in Parliament, killed their king by chopping off his head. Now think about this, from 1215 to 1649, we went from 1215 to the English leadership saying, John, we want you to grant us some concessions, to in 1649, the English leadership killing the king, executing him for treason, no less. The king is executed for treason. Now, why did I spend all this time talking about English history? Because in the middle of the 1600s, right here, 1640s and 1650s, people are now wondering about what just happened. Like what this is called is regicide, the killing of a king. Can we do that? Because in the Middle Ages, it had been thought the divine right of kings, kings are the servants of God. You can't kill them. And if you do, it's damnation for you. Are the, is Parliament cursed for this? Like, what do we do? People had thought in Europe, for example, that they had kings just like there were kings in the Bible. Is that the way it's supposed to be, though? We're supposed to have kings? Or queens or monarchs, dukes, counts, archbishops, like all this whole relationship of the powers over us. Some European thinkers begin to wonder, how did society come to this point where we have kings now anyway? And they also begin to wonder about what the functions of society not only are descriptively, but what they should be. And through this process, we're going to see a tradition of natural rights develop, which hadn't existed previously. Natural rights, that is rights that everyone has, unalienably, as the authors of the Declaration of Independence would say, for all time. So what I've done here is I've talked about the English legacy of rights so far, up to the point of the execution of King Charles I of England and the period of the Interregnum. But this leads us to a period now where the leaders in Parliament say, well, if the king has no right to rule and reign over us, what rights do we, Parliament, have? And what rights do the people have, by extension? So in the next video, we'll look at some of the thinkers that come right out of that time period and examine some of their thought, which ends up being very influential on the subsequent centuries.